So the overview of this is looking at the archaeological record and looking at the patterns there and comparing them to living matricultural societies. And so this has been the approach that I've used all along, looking at the entire cultural record, all different forms of evidence for female-centered societies from the Paleolithic, the Neolithic, a lot of areas that get left out, such as rock art, and uh, you know some very important cultural testimony to women's ceremony. I mean, we don't know that this is a goddess, an ancestor, a, a medicine woman or what, but the sacred patterns with the, the fringe ritual ties and the dotted patterns across the body along her breasts and around her, there's, there's these recurrent patterns that we can see across world history. The emphasis on the female delta on many of the ancient figurines. I will be looking at a few of those. The painted pottery, sculptures, reliefs in all kinds of media. So the starting place for a lot of us is those ancient female icons. And uh, this is a poster I did showing how this is really global in scope. They're not always ceramic, they can be stone, they can be ivory, certainly wood doesn't survive very well though, so we don't have a long record of that most of the time. But what they do show us is that there is this vast lineage of cultures that center around the iconography of ancestral women in all places. And not only in the medium of clay figurines like this, these are both from Eastern Utah, but also in the rock art where we see a pregnant woman with a little being inside of her. There's the invocatory woman with her arms raised in invocation. And also the pattern that we're looking at here is a very important set of ancestral women monoliths in Southern Ethiopia. And so uh, this is something that shows us aspects of women's ceremonial uh, acts as well. But uh, there's some very interesting comparisons to be made. For example, this megalith from Sidamo, we have the breasts and the necklaces, hands to the center of the body, a little marking there for the belt. And we can see identical patterns in a very different time period coming out of Neolithic France. And so some of this is not a diffusionist thing. It arises independently. And we can see all kinds of ancient grandmother stones, as I'm calling them now, in different parts of the planet. So I have some of these I have prints available of that I was going to bring with me to the conference, and so I didn't, I'm not, I don't have time here to explain all of these, but Nicaragua, Sulawesi, this is the Ikom megaliths in Nigeria, uh, the Kipchak Tartar grandmother, the Baba, the Kameni Baba from, in Russian. These all are something we can see archeologically, and I've been tracking these for a long time to the point where I have a whole show just on the grandmother stones of Europe. You can see this female iconography of breasts and necklaces that is shown across most of Western Europe. And then if we look at the wooden grandmothers, I call them the grandmothers from trees, because this is really basically the same spectrum but they're being carved in more perishable materials. This one at the center is a kishi kishi from the Bapende culture in Southern Congo. And she's a roof crest that goes on the top of the house in that matrilineal society. Um, many, many different examples, the Luli altars of Tanimbar and the Maluku uh, Islands, which Ma Maluku has many matrilineal cultures even today. Uh, the Rewe, the ceremonial ladder that is ascended by the Machi shamans as they go into ecstasy. And then I, I mentioned the Kipchak Tartars earlier. There are so many of these, and a lot of them have a chalice that they hold over their womb. I don't know that this was a matrilineal culture, but this is a pattern that is something that persisted into uh, actually very warlike period of time in the early Middle Ages and, and people migrating out of Central Asia. And if we look at Eastern Mexico, we see a tremendous number of stone statues of women, usually wearing these very uh, 
tall and majestic headdresses. Both here are actually the head of the woman is emerging from under the jaws of some kind of protective clan ancestral being, perhaps. Animals, animal protectors, hands over the womb in this case. There's more. And there are so many of these that the museums of the world are full of them. They've been dragged off to London and Berlin and who knows where else. And so this is something to look at. These are the northernmost Maya speakers, and they have a much stronger female focus in their art than we see in the Maya Empire region. Another pattern is mother drums. Now, these are mostly African. This whole left side are all a Yoruba, a Ghana, the, the um, I forget the name for, they, they have a name for these drums. This one is from Dahomey. And so we have not only the breasts indicating motherhood, but also in this case, the womb and the vulva. Ancient Jamon, Japan, living female shaman tradition out of uh, Eastern Asia with the ancestor as the handle on the back of the drum. Samoa, Aboriginal India. And so you've already seen a lot of breast iconography. This is a whole visual talk that I do. This is a massive pattern. And you see everything from breastplates in the matrilineal cultures of the Chibchan societies of Northern Colombia and actually Southern uh, Central America as well. The breast pots, that's, that's you know, a lot of examples here, Philippines, China, uh, East Germany, this is the Nupe in Nigeria. This is Zulu. And, and so these are ceremonial vessels. These are not everyday cooking pots. But it's, again, stunning to see how this is global. We have Tennessee. We have Iran, a Jamon culture in Japan, and um, Colombia. A lot of styles. Some of them, they're tripods, which you see both in Asia, Eastern Asia, and parts of North America, including Mexico or else they have breasts going all the way around the sides of the vessel. And so there's a lot of different types of these, but these are clearly cultural themes that arise independently based on the meaning of the life giver, the nurturing power of the mothers. And so we see very ancient archeological finds in uh, what's now Palestine, Israel, in the Balkans, there's just loads of these. This is the bottom culture, one of the ones that uh, Maria used to talk about. A Mexico, and here again, all the way around the sides, we'll see that same pattern from the Cucutene Tripilia culture in the Balkans and many, many other places. And so when we're looking at ceramics, there's also the painted ceramics. And here we're looking at a women's tradition of inscribing pottery with sacred signs. And as you can see, also ceremony, the invocatory woman, the dancing women. And we, we see this from a lot of different places, but also patterns that recur in different parts of the world. And so I talk about a scripture of signs. Uh, there's a whole presentation now on sacred signs. And a lot of these in, in this picture here are specifically associated with goddesses. For example, the Ankh, the life symbol, in ancient Egypt, the Nyamedua symbol of the Ashanti in Ghana, the Taiyin, uh, the, the, uh, the Taiji symbol with the yin and yang in it, the spiral of Inanna, and the emblem of Nanabuluku in the Fanti traditions that spread actually all over um, Western Africa, and the womb sun disk that was worn over the womb on belts of women in Bronze Age Denmark. So there's a lot of patterns we could track, and as I'm trying to indicate, you know, these are each each of these topics are entire uh, in-depth collections that we can follow. The, a lot of the traditions are not as well known to us. Uh, most people here will be familiar with Maria Gimbutas, but not know about the Greenlandic and the Inuit walrus ivory sculptures or uh, the rich art, I'm gonna put a few of those in here, of women who are painted up for ceremony out of ancient Costa Rica. And so in tracking these patterns, these are a couple posters that I've made. Uh, one of them, uh, Miriam Robbins Dexter talks about sacred display 
you know, because really Sheila and the Gigs is something particular to Europe, at least in the naming. But we have tantric forms of this out of India. We have the ancestral Jangawul sisters as birth givers, again, with the ritual ties out of Arnhem Land in Northern Australia. We have Iroquois combs with the life givers, uh, Vanuatu, lots of different places in the Pacific Islands. Uh, these, these symbols are pretty much global. Here we have down here, Lipinski Veer. Uh, here's our Sheila from uh, Britain. And then even older than that are the vulva stones. And these, some of these are exceedingly archaic. This one down here is a whole, a whole canyon in Queensland, now known as Carnarvon Gorge, that is engraved with hundreds and probably thousands of vulvas, deep engraved, like people are coming back and grooving them deeper as part of the ceremonial acts around women's business in Australia. And so there's a lot of these, Bolivia, Thailand, Hawaii, in Hawaii, these were used to place placentas. So there's a direct uh, living tradition that connects them with the process of birth and the ceremonies around that. And sometimes the hardest recoveries for us to dig out are those out of the colonized Americas and particularly North America. And it has been veiled from our view. Those of us who grew up there never got to see any of these icons and you have the sacred women pipes and um, other kinds of the spider grandmother who comes through both in the southeast and the southwest the adena tablets there's lots of rich symbolic and historical uh, testimony here and so this we have to track and re we have to decolonize our our cultural memory of what this continent north america looks like if you are scanning the entire cultural record so that you're looking at the carved shells of the Cherokee world and of ancient Alabama and the pottery of Florida and the basketry of the Wabanaki, Wabanaki cultures and the painted parflesh containers that were used by women in the Great Plains and certainly the basketry traditions of the Pomo and the Nez Perce and the Salish weaving of the Northwest. So many different ways of conveying cosmological symbolism here out of the Arapaho world. And you've got the quadrants, the concentric circles, labyrinths, all of this. So what we're really engaged in doing is remapping our awareness of human cultural record. And so here for Africa, you know, to know that these things exist in women's house wall paintings, in their weavings, the ancient Neolithic paintings on the rock art of Chad in Algeria and Niger. And also these, these triangular patterns are something that are very strongly connected with matricultural themes in the Congo. For example, among the Bakuba and the Mapende people. So part of this search, I'm, I'm getting a duplicate sound here all of a sudden, is to, to try and see what does female sovereignty look like? Untrammeled female authority and honor, expression. And we can see this even in a living context because the Wet'suwet matriarchs Everything comes together. They're leading the fight against the colonial extraction of energy. They're defending the land. They're protecting native sab sovereignty in a matrilineal cultural context where women's ceremonial leadership is prominent and it is advocating for the defense of native women from murder and rape, from the man camp and from the missing and murdered indigenous women. This is the patterns of patriarchy. So everything comes together in that struggle. And the ceremonial aspect of that too leads us into a huge subject, which is, you know, under whatever name, the medicine women and the Tungutu and the Izangoma, and we can track this again through archeology. span This is what I was doing in the DVD, Women Shamans, the Ancients. 
the invocatory postures, the sacred dance, the sacred rattles and drums, which we see here also from the ancient Canaanites, uh, ceremonial scenes from Eastern Asia, from South America, from West Africa. And so these are all still surviving living traditions. And here I'm calling this matricultural, but many of these are in severely patriarchal societies, such as Korea, but this survival of the Mudang, of the Manchin tradition is something that is still sought after by people who are in trouble mm -hmm. in healing, uh, have family problems mm -hmm. or business problems. They resort to the spiritual wisdom of these trans priestesses who commune with ancestors and find out what's what and where the remedies are. Uh, the priestess traditions of West Africa, also this is in Togo. And so there are entire groups of themes that we can look at with one of them, of course, is healing. And you've got the drum, the sacred rattle, rubbing herbs, we're working with the plant beings in order to transform human body and consciousness to restore things back into balance. So we have our herbalists, the binding on of herbs also practiced here in England in this ancient medieval, medieval picture. The ceremonial regalia, which recurs the feathered headdresses here from Burundi, but which also turn up in other parts of southwestern Africa, southeastern Africa, but also show up in Nepal and many other parts of the world. And so the names given to these women, who are often called holy women in Native North America nowadays, Mashkiki in the language of the Anishinaabek, Aim for the Karok, Yomta for the Kashaya tradition that S.E. Parrish exemplified and carried on. If we're in Africa, they may be called Bori Magajiar, the, the, the priestesses of the spirit. Uh, the Bantu names Isangoma and Nanga, or variations thereof, and lots of these names. So because shaman is so culturally specific, there's been an argument in academia about whether we can use it. And of course, we don't know the titles for all of the cultures, particularly when we're looking at uh, the archeological records. So I think that we, we have to have a multiplicity of ways of referring to these female spheres of power. Not to say that no men do this, but in some places the pattern is very strongly female. And so uh, here the sacred kale and clay painted on the face as a way of entering into the realm of the ancestors. So many patterns going on here. The gourd rattles, the bells, the feathered headdresses, uh, not only rattles, but also sacred receptacles. Uh, connections with the animal world through beaks and bones and tusks. And then Asia, where the word shaman itself originates among the Tungusic speakers of uh, Northeastern Asia. But Mongolian and Turkic names, Udagan, the Chinese Wu, uh, the Mudang of Korea, the Mikogami of Japan, and many, many others. You see a lot of sacred drum going on in here. This is Nepal. And in Europe, as a lot of you know, I've been working intensively on decolonizing the European uh, history and recovering knowledge of who are the witches under all their names, Vulva, Strega, Noita in Finnish, Libestra, Anglo-Saxon, Viestitsa, the knower from the various Slavic languages, Sosier, which originally meant the lot reader or the lot caster, Bruja, Vitka, Saga, the wise woman, and so going out of that a little bit into a broader sphere, we have to look at women as culture makers and whether they're fashioning and painting these ancient figurines or whether it is the weavers, and this is in the Southern Philippines, the Tuboli weavers who are famous for their birth cloths and scenes of ancestral women giving birth. This is still a living tradition. This is one of the master weavers out of that part of Mindanao. And in the Iban world of Kalimantan, this is what, what we call Borneo, uh, the Pua cloths, uh, the weavers made these ceremonial cloths that figure in all kinds of important rites of passage, including birth and death, elaborate weaving patterns. And this tracks very well with what Mary Kelly was, was following, 
not only in Europe, but she really expanded into South America and other places, these, these hidden images of the birthing mother that we see in the Rojanitsi of Eastern Russia and many, many other cultural symbolic systems. And so in Peru, this is a very ancient and elaborate weaving tradition. Here's an example of medieval uh, tapestries in many, many different styles in Peru and still a living tradition that is also strongly connected with dreaming. So you've got the weaver dreaming her patterns, something you see also in North America. And so the ceremonial cloths, which the Russians call rushniki, are used to cover offerings of loaves. They hang over the altar corner, the icon corner in the Slavic world. They're found in the Finnish world. And they have to do with the passages of birth, initiation, marriage, death, healing, all kinds of ceremonial contexts. And so you see that scripture of signs also making its way in weaving very, very strongly. And uh, these patterns of the quadrant, a lot of other pattern, this particularly around the edges is seen a lot in Saharan art. You see it in Tunisia, various different places. These are Moroccan and there, you can see a little bit of relationship here in the, the henna painting on cloth woven. This one from Slavonia. So again, that recurrence of, of themes or patterns. And so of course, when we're talking about weaving, we also have this global pattern of the cosmic weaver. And whether it's the spinners of fate or the, the spindle that is so strongly associated in both the Maya and the Aztec world with the great mother or the grandmother being. Uh, here we have her as uh, Tlazoteotl out of the Aztec tradition, but spider grandmother as a weaver and as a creator, as a fire bringer the very ancient litanies of the great mother of the gods, Nate, out of Egypt, with her shuttle icon, and also associated with the great waters, and this form of the symbol of Nun, as it's called in Egypt, or Numo, and the seventh Numo in the Dogon culture. Si Wangmu, the great yin, also a cosmic weaver. Lots of deep traditions around that. And so with weaving, we can't only look at cloth because the weaving of vegetal fibers is really important, not only for day-to-day -day items, but also for um, baskets that are used sometimes in divination, other sacred contexts. Uh, you have gift baskets, initiatory baskets that are uh, also gifted to young women by older female relatives. So this is a whole study in itself. Someday I'll get that show scanned. There's these two sides then to the female potter. She's making something, a technology and an art, but also there is meaning woven into it. When you look at this, I think this is in the Colorado River Basin, uh, the images of ancestral women or deities that are figured into these pots. And so in Macedonia, not only pottery, but also ceramic sculpture in the form of the ancestral mother or there's the mother pot. And these kinds of enclosed calabashes or pots, both forms, are very important in South Central Africa. So this is out of the Baluba tradition. You can have the, the crowning figure here, gesture of hands to the breasts. This is really, really ancient and very, very global, which we also see here out of the, um, the Agitas culture in the Southern Andes. Here it is from the Balkans, the vessel in the form of the ancestral woman, and also in the burial urns of uh, the, the Marajo and other Brazilian cultures. So just briefly, I want to just mention that there is this mixture between the technological and the economic aspect of survival, and then the, the inscription of cultural symbols, the spirals, the quadrants, all these things that are painted or woven into the things that women are making and using in daily life so that the spiritual aspect is integrated. It's not a separate realm. This is very matricultural. It's that uni unity of vision in the life ways. So women provide food, they farm it, they gather it, they build the houses. These are Wichita women who are thatching the classic Cadawan style of lodge 
that is found in the Southern Plains and into Texas and Louisiana. And women also weave the tents in the nomadic worlds, whether we're talking about North Africa or the um, Southwest Asian Bedouin peoples or the Tibetans. And so here, this is in Algeria, uh, so-called Berber women, they weave these tents. And you can see the whole integration of the women's realm here, whether they're steaming couscous or they've got the ground looms where they're actually taking goat hair or whatever it is that they're working with and they're weaving these gigantic swaths of cloth that provide them shelter from sun and cold. And then there's this whole complex around birth. And here the woman giving birth in her own alone and also helped by the doula and the old midwife out of the uh, Hamacuaque culture of Ecuador. And so Costa Rica is really rich in this. There's a lot of very strong birth iconography in their ancient sculpture here. The child is crowning out and the agonies of birth, the grimaces, we'll see this also in Cameroon and other places. Uh, lots of birth iconography in the Moche culture. Now this, I would guess, is a patrilineal society. We don't really have records of that, but there's some very patriarchal cultural themes going on in the archaeology, and yet there is also a very strong emphasis on women's powers as mothers and also as uh, priestesses and shamans in the Moche culture. And so there's all kinds of ceremony that women evolve to protect around the passage of pregnancy and childbirth. And so this, these kinds of pregnancy robes, sort of a form like the string skirt, the many fringes are part of, the, part of the protective meaning of them. The face painted with the white clay as we see in Africa, but here they're actually breathing on the robe to infuse it with vital force. This is in uh, the area just east of Papua New Guinea. And so ceremonies that women evolved, very elaborate ones many times around initiation into womanhood here, a Navajo elder relative is massaging the body of the new woman in order to shape her in ceremonially in the right way, in a harmonious way. You've got the dances of the antelope headdresses that are part of initiation ceremonies. I'm forgetting if this is Senegal, I think maybe. Um, and so there's a lot of archaeological evidence of women's circle dances, the round dance, the invocatory posture here coming through again. This is, I don't have an idea on this, but I'm guessing that this is the uh, Bactria Margiana culture, the BMAC culture in West Central Asia. And so that is a whole series. That's a whole topic too. Now, a lot of these are titles for, for uh, visual talks that I've put together based on these patterns. And so the women's dance, whether we see it in ancient Neolithic Iran or in living Hawaiian traditions of the Kahiko Hula, uh, Ganton Ble religion, the carvings on the walls of temples in India, the whole tradition of the sacred temple dance. And so there are really amazing things. Even those of us who have followed Chatal Huyuk and Hasilar uh, there are yet more things to be known. And one of the important sites that I've discovered in the last several years is Kuskhuyuk. And I'm not even really sure exactly where that is, but you have women dancing arm in arm on the side of pots. This is a fragmentary pot. You can see they're, they're molded in very deep relief. And the body type here with this fat belly ridge and the in recessed female delta is a cultural pattern that begins in Southwest Asia and eventually disseminates all the way across into the central Mediterranean. And I'll hear again the invocatory posture and the hair blowing in the wind, kind of a pillar head there. So this theme shows up not just in Asia Minor, but also in Mesopotamia. And so you've got the women standing in the four directions and their hair is blowing. So if we look at this quadrant as an indicator of space in the form of the directions, we can look at the direction of movement shown by the blowing hair as an indicator of time so that we're really seeing a philosophical expression of the time-space matrix here. 
And the scorpion, which I'm not really sure how this how she comes into this, but the scorpion has a goddess valence in the Neolithic art of Southern Asia, Iran too, and even over into the Indus Valley. Here again, the women dancing hand in hand with their hair blowing, and maybe this is an indicator of movement, in harmony with the natural world out of what's now Pakistan. There's another one. These I know that there's got to be a lot more of these. These are very abstract. So this shows to me that this is a theme that had been created for a long time. So that, um, you know, they're really just reduced down to, to very elemental shapes. But the dancing women, they're painting themselves in these villages doing ceremony on their pottery. And there's a lot of places where this shows up that you would not necessarily expect. This is not the Greece that they showed us. Naked women with either uh, leaf skirts, or in some of the pictures, it almost looks like they're wearing snakes or have snakes rising up from the earth between them, hand in hand, and they're actually holding clumps of foliage as they dance the circle dance. And you have these beautiful interweaving of women's arms from the ancient uh, great Greek Hellenic settlements in southern Italy, and we see this pattern showing up in modern Bulgarian dances. Joan Marler has done a lot of work on this. But you also see this linkage coming up in Kawaika, in one of the Kiva murals of the Hopi, maybe a thousand years ago. These are all female figures, this wrapping of the cloth around the breasts. And then the Motokik societies of the Northern Plains, uh, from the Blackfeet to the Mandans. The Mandans, by the way, this is a major matrilineal, uh, matrilocal social pattern in the Upper Missouri River. And you can see the rich ceremonial regalia with the headdresses. There's our feathers again. Uh, the wing of a water bird. The water birds were really important in their planting cycles. They would know that when the geese and the ducks came back, the swans, came back from the south, those were the calendrical signals from old woman who never dies, that it's time to plant the corn, beans, the squash. So they read the signs of the earth. And this is all integrated, the agriculture and the survival and the ceremony all together. And so here again from ancient Iraq, I love this. We're seeing dreadlocks coming out of uh, the Diyala region. Uh, possibly a ceremonial dance here again with the animals present here. And then uh, the, there's a close-up of, these are five of these giant petroglyphs that are carved into the wall of a mountain uh, that the, the Amazigh people still come by there on their trade routes. And they leave offerings at the foot of this mountain of cloth and food, but they also, somebody has climbed up here and colored this in with chalk and uh, charcoal. So these are still kept alive. It's very similar to the way in Australia that they will come back and repaint the, the ancient sacred dreamings on the rocks and cave walls. And so there's a very broad uh, dissemination. I'm not going to give you a lot of the invoker figures, uh, but they're found a lot in the Americas as well. This is from Baja. Look at the feather headdress there again. And interestingly, there's a very rich record of these invoking women, or perhaps their ancestors, and they're giving their benediction, but uh, especially in Southwest Arabia. But in many parts of, of the Arabian world, uh, up in Jordan also, you'll see some of these figures. And so there's this very predominant uh, image of women as spiritual blessers or ceremonial leaders. And we can see glimpses of that also in Southwest Africa. And so this woman face, you can't really see it very well here, but her face is painted white. She's wearing a, a flower headdress like that, that the San people still wear, beaded regalia. She's carrying a wand. She has got the weed bead waists. Sorry, I'm losing it. A waist beads and so that's a precious piece of testimony. And this is not a very high res picture, but we can identify this as a female figure from Zimbabwe because of the breasts poking out from one side. This is classic Pan-African representation of um, the, the torso and profile that you see. And she also has a wand in her hand. 
This is such a huge marked theme that in the Woman Shaman DVD, there's a whole chapter. I didn't plan it like this, but just the preponderance of imagery, a chapter on the sacred staff of the medicine woman. So, you know, we can look in very culturally specific ways at matricultural patterns, and that's very strong in the art of pre pharaonic Egypt. We have pots like this. There's a very strong theme of the female figure with the upper body painted in red ochre and the lower body clothed in white linen wraps. This is how women were dressing then. Uh, the vulture headed figures that are famous, a lot of you will know these, but also, um, and, and here they are again, actually, this is a ceremonial vessel showing up also in uh, the invoking woman in the painted pots of the Nakata period, uh, figurines in ivory and lapis lazuli showing the ancestral women. There's a lot of very interesting female iconography in that era before the empire. And so we can track the same kinds of patterns in the Aegean islands, uh, Greece, and you know, the specific this is, this is the regional shows that I do, is just to try and go chronologically through the cultural record in one particular part of the world. This is a, a very important pattern, which is the, they call them the uh, frying pans, <laughs> but they are votive platters, and you're not seeing the whole thing here, but um, the spiral pattern inside the womb. Could have thrown one of those in. Uh, so Crete, of course, is famous to mo most of us as an important repository of matricultural symbolism, uh, ceremonial dance, Ariadne in the labyrinth, uh, a lot of goddess symbolism, serpents, uh, all kinds of things. And then in China, this is less known to most of us, there are ceremonial vessels from the uh, Warring States period where we're still seeing women doing ceremony inside of temples with the same kind of vessels that these are engraved upon. And so they're preparing food and drink offerings. And then below here, this is on the, sort of in the understory of the temple, they are drumming, they are playing uh, chimes, stone chimes that are hung from the ceiling. They are playing on bronze gongs in the presence of various birds and animals, which you can see around the borders. And then there's this very interesting figure, maybe, this is actually a goddess or an ancestor who has her arms raised in that invocatory posture. So there are a lot of these and they just don't get published. And th they're part of this pattern of the Wu priestesses who we know were still continuing under increasing persecution into the Tang dynasty. Uh, the older levels of Chinese literature make reference to the Wu as ceremonial leaders and predominantly female. And so we've seen a little bit from the very rich Hamakuake culture. Ecuador is one of those countries that's off most people's radars, and yet they have such a very strong iconographic focus on women. And this is another form of the invoker where instead of re raising the arms up toward the heavens, she's reaching toward the earth. The palms open, really important um, pattern that we'll see in various places. And here again, the hands to the breast gesture. So this is very interesting because this is, uh, you know, Java, we don't really know what kind of lineage system was going on when this was carved, but there was a bunch of kingdoms and even empires of the Javanese. This is a lot of clear Indian influence going on here. But what they did is the symbolism of this fountain is when the monsoon waters fill up the water table, then water would was channeled to shoot out through the breasts of these statues. And so you have the life giver pouring milk symbolically into a ceremonial tank that was used Indian style for ceremony. And so that's Chandi Belahan, and Chandi is a word for uh, temple in, in Indonesia. And we also have in a long, very parallel way, Goa Gaja in Bali. And this time, instead of it, the liquid coming from their breasts. Here's a better view. They are holding pots. So these figures track very closely with the Hindi term apsaras, actually Sanskrit. It means the water women. A lot of times you'll see this translated as nymphs, which is originally what that meant in Greece. 
they had a, a parallel concept. But uh, the water bearers, water is life, is basically the concept here as well. And another form of this that we can get a glimpse of old ceremony from is the Lady of Galera, where you have an alabaster sculpture open at the top. And when they poured a liquid in through her head, it shot out through her breasts into the basin that she was holding. So people could come up and perhaps dip their fingers in it and bless themselves with the milk or whatever liquid it was. It could have been oil or wine, we don't know, uh, from the breasts of the goddess herself. And another point about her that I think is really important is in the Hebrew tradition, you have the divine glory seated on the, the throne of mercy between the two cherubim, who are female-headed uh, chimeric beings, part lion, winged creatures. And so in the pagan worlds of the Phoenicians and the Canaanites, uh, Lebanese, you find the goddess is still seated in that position. She kind of disappears into a cloud of glory, uh, not represented any longer as a goddess, but she persists anyway in the memory of the Hebrew tradition. These breast symbolisms are really going back into the archaic period of the Neolithic, very important. And there's a site in uh, the Bodensee region, Lake Constance of Southern Germany, at Ludwigshafen, and I think there's a couple other sites that they found where there were reliefs on the walls of the ancestral woman with molded breasts. And these dotted patterns around the breasts are something that are found in a lot of places, not least in Northern Africa. The dots representing the shimmering of numinous power that's present in the breasts. So you'll see this, we saw it earlier and I didn't really mention it, but the the mural from Al Algeria, Awanrit, of the running woman, has those dots over the breasts. And so we see murals also, or, or reliefs really, of the matrilineal but patrilocal Nuba cultures, which have been so much under siege in recent uh, decades um, in the uh, religious extremist uh, attacks on their villages. But the image of the woman ancestor is actually molded into the walls of the house. You'll see this in a couple other places in Northeast Africa. And then offerings of the staff of life in the form of the beans and the sorghum attached because the ancestors bring the rain and they are the nurturing power that the earth gives us to feed ourselves. So these doors in the form of breasts, I didn't put the Dagon examples in here, but they also were doing these. Uh, the ancestral woman on the door to the house in company with the spiral uh, symbolism that's so com commonly part of not only a matricultural view, but just a, a human uh, animacy. I like the word that uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer used because animus got kind of tainted from the anthropological uh, framework in, into a very objectifying and, and uh, looking down their nose form, but animacy kind of re revives us to us because it basically means the presence of spirit in everything. So Timor, uh, there's a history of matrilineage lineage there. It's a very mixed pattern right now, but there's some parts of East Timor continued to have uh, mother right lineage. And then we can look at the Nok ivories out of Nigeria, really incredibly masterful sculptures of women with their hands pointed to their breast. The hand figuring here, very much tracking with Yoruba art. Here's their dots on the breast again, that shimmering of life force pattern over the belly and the breast. And this could be representation of tattooing or even ritual paint. But then you have to ask, why did they do that? And then it goes back again to this numinous flow that is perceived inside of women's bodies. And so symbolically, this all gets projected out too into a golden breastplates that were worn by matrilineal peoples in the Sinu cultures and other cultures of Northern Colombia. And so um, we don't know that these could have also been worn by men because they're participating in this honoring of the female ancestors. And so we see this moving up into Panama. There are these pendants. You can see the the openings here, these are meant to be hung 
from something, maybe someone's chest, and you've got these very clear breasts pounded out of a sheet of gold. And so here's the same pattern. There's no connection to these historically or chronologically. This is far, far older, but the same exact thing of, of repoussé sheets of gold meant to be hung on something in the, in the image of the ancestral breasts. I don't know why three here. Could even be a belly, I suppose. Well, here it is again from Costa Rica. So these two parts of the world especially uh, came up independently with the same kind of symbolism. This one has a little animal figure, a human animal. I'm not sure what those are. Uh, here's another one with Panama of the eyes, very similar to the eyes of Inanna and other kinds of ancestor eyes that we see in other parts of the world. And then finally back to southeastern um, Indonesia in Maluku and Tanimbar, these, these relics of the ancestral uh, imagery of female breasts.